Hi, my name is Sarah Eady, and I'm a cardiology pharmacist at University of Michigan. Today, I'll be discussing anticoagulation in patients with COVID-19. There are several ways in which the COVID-19 pandemic may affect the preven prevention and management of thrombotic and thromboembolic disease. Both direct effects of COVID-19 or the indirect effects of infection, such as through severe illness and hypoxia, may predispose patients to thrombotic events. Hemostatic abnormalities have also been extensively reported in these individuals. Additionally, the severe inflammatory response, critical illness, and underlying traditional risk factors may all predispose patients to thrombotic events similar to prior coronavirus outbreaks. Let's focus a little more on those hemostatic abnormalities. Consistent hemostatic abnormalities with COVID-19 include mild thrombocytopenia and increased D-dimer levels, which have been associated with a higher risk of requiring mechanical ventilation, ICU admission, or death. Disease severity is variably associated with prolongation of the prothrombin time and international normalized ratio and thrombin time, and variably by a trend towards shortened activated partial thromboplastic time. Additionally, a recent study looked at three cases with severe COVID-19 and cerebral infarction, with one patient having a bilateral limb ischemia. All these patients had elevated antiphospholipid antibodies. However, the authors note that these antibodies can also rise transiently in patients with critical illness and various infections. So whether these antiphospholipid antibodies play a major role in the pathophysiology of thrombosis associated with COVID-19 requires further investigation. But what are the consequences of these hemostasis parameter abnormalities? Dave and colleagues assessed 183 patients with COVID-19, 21 of whom died. Among notable differences between patients who died and those who survived were increased levels of D-dimer and fibrin degradation products and PT prolongation. These hemostatic changes indicate some forms of coagulopathy that may predispose patients to thrombotic events. However, it is not known whether these hemostatic changes are a specific effect of COVID-19 or are a consequence of the cytokine storm that precipitates the onset of systemic inflammatory response syndrome as observed in other viral diseases. Knowing these differences, Future research should focus on optimal anticoagulant monitoring parameters for COVID-19 patients receiving unfractionated heparin. If the APTT is low in these patients, adjustments to heparin dosing to reach therapeutic levels may result in over-anticoagulation. Some institutions use anti-10A levels to monitor heparin. Currently, the impact on these levels is unknown. Um, though currently at Michigan, we've had some alterations in anti-10A levels um, in our patient, COVID-19 patients receiving heparin. However, current guidance from the anticoagulation forum that was published recently does recommend using anti-10A instead of APTT for monitoring patients on unfractionated heparin. Prophylaxis is especially important in these patients considering the instance of thrombotic events. A report from Milan, Italy, reported 21% thrombotic incidence with the majority of cases occurring in ICU patients. All ICU patients received thromboprophylaxis with low molecular weight heparin. 75% of patients on the general floors received thromboprophylaxis. Similarly, a retrospective study from China among 81 patients with severe COVID admitted to the ICU, 25% developed incident VTE. Notably, none of these patients receive VT prophylaxis. In a study of 184 patients with severe COVID-19 from three academic medical centers in the Netherlands, there was a 31% incidence of VTE. All patients received pharmacological prophylaxis, yet underdosing was reported in two of the three participating centers. Notably, these values are much higher than the rate of symptomatic VTE events observed in thromboprophylaxis trials in medically ill population, which typically doesn't exceed 3% in patients not receiving anticoagulant therapy and less than 1% receiving thromboprophylaxis. 
Hospitalized patients with acute medical illness are at an increased risk of VTE. Hospitalized patients with COVID-19 um, we know are high risk, and a lot of them have other comorbidities or respiratory failure. They may be bedridden um, or requiring intensive care unit. So they should really be receiving pharmacological VT prophylaxis unless contraindicated. However, one of the current controversies is, while we know these patients should be receiving pharmacological prophylaxis, what dose of pharmacological prophylaxis should they be receiving? In this prospective observational study, the authors aim to characterize the coagulation profile of COVID-19 ARDS patients after establishment of aggressive thromboprophylaxis. Baseline testing was done on 16 patients receiving 4,000 units of nadroparin twice daily. We, we aren't really familiar with nadroparin um, here, but that's nadroparin 4,000 international units is equivalent to anoxaparin 40 milligrams. In this study, nadroparin dosing was empirically increased to 6,000 units or 8,000 units twice daily for those with a BMI over 35. Follow-up levels were available for 10 patients after seven days of the increased dose. Notably, after increasing the dose of thromboprophylaxis, there was a significant time-related decrease in the viscoelastic parameters as listed here. Now, at some institutions, we may not have access to some of these viscoelastic parameters. Um, some institutions do, and they may include things like thromboelastography or TAG. Um, TAG is currently under investigation for COVID-19-associated coagulopathy. One study in Italy looked at whole blood from 24 patients in the ICU due to COVID-19 and evaluated TAG parameters. Their parameters were consistent with a state of hypercoagulability um, shown by decreased R and K values and increased, angle, increased values of the K angle. However, we didn't have imaging on these patients to confirm thrombotic events in that population. So while TEG may be available in some institutions, we expect that it will show a hypercoagulable state in these patients, and we don't have good guidance on which levels um, may, may lead us to empirically anticoagulating them. So really more needs to be done before we use that um, more widely in these patient populations. Previous Netherlands study I mentioned also used an increased prophylaxis dose of low molecular weight heparin after one month of treating COVID-19 patients. The authors theorized that these increased doses may be required to overcome the dramatic elevations in levels of procoagulant factors that are not present in the standard post-op or hospitalized medically ill patient. Yet, due to the design of the study, the authors do admit that they could not adjust the findings for the actual administered doses of nadroparin, the low molecular weight heparin used in this study, or study the effect of the changes in the local protocols for thromboprophylaxis. Yet, the authors suggest strict pharmacological thrombosis prophylaxis in all COVID-19 patients admitted to the ICU and suggest increasing the prophylactic dose in their wards such as anoxaparin 40 milligrams twice daily, um, even in the absence of randomized evidence. Notably, the anticoagulation forum that I mentioned previously that was recently released also suggests using increased doses of VT prophylaxis in critically ill patients who are confirmed or highly suspected um, COVID-19 positive. These studies and these recommendations all suggest using um, heparin or low molecular weight heparin for thromboprophylaxis, um, then we currently do not have a lot of data to guide us um, using prophylaxis with the new direct oral anticoagulants or DOAX. We know there are several studies for VT prophylaxis in medically ill patients, including studies looking at extended prophylaxis in medically ill patients. Those listed here uses oral bitrixaban and oral rivaroxaban for up to 45 days after hospitalization. In APEX, there was no significant difference between extended duration batrixaban and standard regimen of anoxaparin in the pre-specified primary outcome of a composite of asymptomatic proximal DBT and symptomatic VTE in acutely medically ill, medically Ill patients with an elevated D-dimer level. 
In Mariner, rivaroxaban given to medical patients for 45 days after hospital discharge was not associated with a significantly lower risk of symptomatic VTE and death due to VTE versus placebo. So what these studies tell us is they did not reduce the incidence of symptomatic VTE in medically ill patients when continued for several um, days after hospital discharge. However, the role of extended VT prophylaxis in patients with COVID is unknown. Some theorize that these patients may benefit given a lengthy disease course that may increase the likelihood of immobility. If these are used for extended VT prophylaxis, D-dimer should not be used alone, but consider a validated risk score such as improved from Mariner to help guide decision making. Notably, in Mariner, as listed um, on your right of your screen, they use this improved score um, for or more to choose patients who are eligible for rivaroxaban, or improved score 2, 3, and a D-dimer more than two times the upper limit of normal. However, while DOACs may be um, beneficial in that they don't have a lot of monitoring, some have theorized that heparin may be more beneficial in this patient population given its anti-inflammatory function which led some authors to study the utilization in hospitalized COVID-19 patients. This was a retrospective study in about 450 patients, 99 of whom received heparin for, the major for which the majority received low molecular weight heparin for seven days or longer. The doses used are on the bottom right of your screen. The authors used a SICK score, which was based on the SOFA score along with the platelet count and INR. Notably, the authors found no difference in 28-day mortality between heparin users and non-users, but the 28-day mortality of heparin users was lower than non-users in patients with a SICK score of four or more, or a D-dimer over six-fold the upper limit of normal. Notably, the authors um, suggest to use anticoagulation, but if you look at this dosing, prophylactic dosing of low molecular weight heparin was used in most of the heparin users. So this, the outcomes of the study have led some to think we should be putting therapeutic anticoagulation on many of these patients if they have um, some of these risk factors. However, from the study, we can only really say therapeutic, um, or excuse me, Prophylactic anticoagulation in these patients is probably beneficial, and we don't really know the role for empiric therapeutic anticoagulation at the moment. However, if patients do um, develop a VTE or we have high suspicion and we cannot test them, we do have some considerations for VTE medical treatment. A selection of agent re requires consideration of comorbidities such as renal hepatic dysfunction, GI tract function, among others. Parenteral anticoagulation may be preferred in critically ill patients as it may be temporarily withheld and has no drug-drug interactions with investigational COVID-19 therapies. However, there are concerns with time to achieve therapeutic levels and increased healthcare worker exposure for frequent blood draws. Additionally, as mentioned previously, it may be difficult to ascertain if the levels are truly therapeutic if some of those hemostatic parameters are altered in these patients. Low molecular weight heparin may be used in those unlikely to need procedures, but renal function should be monitored closely and levels could be obtained if on for prolonged therapy. Additionally, dosing with obesity can get a little tricky, so that's where some of our levels may need to be obtained in that patient population. The benefit of DOACs include lack of need for monitoring, as well as the facilitation and discharge planning, but we should be cognizant of drug, renal function and drug-drug interaction. Um, for treating these patients, some are thinking that we should be treating them like a provoked VT or PE, so consider three months of treatment, but again, we don't have good guidance on the optimal duration at this time. Looking here at some potential drug interactions, on your left column are investigational COVID-19 therapies, um, and in the middle columns include warfarin as well as our newer direct oral anticoagulants and some considerations that we may need to take into, take into our thought process when deciding the best agent for these patients. Um, some of the interactions include PGP inhibition, um, list of agents such as a Pixaban, Rivaroxaban, we need to be concerned for CYP3A4 as well as PGP inhibition. 
In summary, hospitalized patients with COVID-19 are at a high thrombotic risk. Consider VT prophylaxis in hospitalized patients with a potential higher VT prophylaxis dose used in ICU patients. The role of empiric therapeutic anticoagulation is currently unknown. In those patients who have developed a VTE or have a high suspicion of VT for which they're receiving treatment, consider utilization of DOAX in eligible patients to minimize monitoring and facilitating discharge. I know we talked about a lot of unknowns um, at this time, but hopefully with upcoming research, we'll get more answers. Some of the ongoing studies are listed here, and they deal with many of the common themes we discussed today, such as therapeutic anticoagulation versus thromboprophylaxis, standard versus higher dose thr thromboprophylaxis, um, some of those viscoelastic parameters that we mentioned, as well as some novel things such as nebulized um, TPA for these patients. Thank you for your time today, and let me know if you have any questions.